was so incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, have you always been a writer? Um, I have always been a writer. So the story goes is that when I was six years old, I passed by stop sign, or by a street sign so often that I learned how to spell it, and I personified it and turned it into a poem. I don't know what it was about. I can't tell you. I don't know where it is, but I, that's what I did. <laughs> like you did. Yeah. Here you are. So here I am. Stop sign. Yeah. You often didn't stop right. anybody. So maybe you didn't interpret the stop sign. Right. Totally. You yeah. just learned how to spell it. Totally. Well, that's cool. So you haven't. You've always been a writer. And where are you originally from? Um, I'm from the San Fernando Valley, so uh, in Los Angeles area, California. Okay. Cool. 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 And so you grew up your whole adolescence there. Yes. It was interesting. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, it was very interesting, actually. Um, I, so I was actually, when you were interviewing uh, Max, I was thinking about that also, and I was like, um, in elementary school, I remember having a lot of crushes on a lot of different people. Um, some of them uh, identified as female, and it just didn't, like, it was like, that was the thing I could not say, right? Um, and uh, so, like, I'm half Filipino, and so I was raised very Catholic, and that was just not, Okay, um, and then uh, when I was really early in high school, my sister came out as a lesbian, and I was like, "Oh, I can be one of those things," um, but maybe not, right? So, yeah. How did you? Was your first exposure to the LGBTQ community through your sister? Yeah, I tag along to a lot of things, um, kind of on purpose. I was doing my research. Um, I'm a researcher. Um, but, uh, so I went to a lot, you know, I went to West Hollywood. West Hollywood's like the gay area of LA. I don't know if it still is because, you know, gentrification. But, um, but I went to a lot of that, and then I went to Pride, and I was like, wow, there's lots of people that are super gay, and like, assless chaps are a thing. And, like, <laughs> So like it like opened my eyes to this whole new world of people. Is it just you and your sister? Yes, yes. So both of your parents' kids were queer. I love for them. Yes. Did they did they feel that way? No. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not at all. Um, so my sister came out first, and that was sort of it was sort of uh, it was a hard it wasn't. I don't know. Let's, let's say this. I was the younger I was the younger one, and so I don't know that the the difficulty she may have had. Um, coming out. Um, so we have different fathers, and so she lived with her father for a little bit, and so I didn't get to see everything. Um, but when I came out, it was this big old thing because I was the last hope, right? Like I was the last hope for normal kids, right? And so um, it was sort of this like very heartbreak moment between my mom and myself where it was just like, you were the one, you were the chosen one, you know, you were the golden child. And I was like, no, I'm kidding, sorry. Like, not gonna happen. Isn't that funny that, are there any parents in the room? Parents, do a little woo for me. Woo! Okay, right. Like six parents. Yeah, yeah, amazing. You're doing the right thing by being here. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, parents. Um, it's pretty wild. So my mom had a, an, an, I'm her um, only child, and we were very close, and she actually like, ran like the P-Flax of our group for LGBT, so she's very on board. But when I came out, that she told me there was a mourning process. Yeah a morning process for what she thought my life was going to be. Yeah, yeah. And I think as parents, we have these great expectations for our children. We want the best for them, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> and so we want the best for them. We want them to thrive and be happy. And usually that's like a very like uh, cis hetero patriarchy model of happy, of course. Okay. And so I also think parents are really scared for their queer children. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that Definitely a fear. Um, something that I came to terms with as an adult, as I came out as a transgender person, um, was that my mom had a grieving process because not only was it, you know, this this woman that never existed is no longer going to, or is not existing, um, but I think also uh, the fear of rejection from the rest of the world, and then like also being a person of color and already receiving that rejection. Um, was also part of that. So it's like you're also you're a brown person and you're also trans. Like, what are you doing? Like, you're you know you're just gone now. You know. So yeah. Are your parents and you? What's your relationship with them now? My stepdad has this very interesting relationship with me where he wants to bro me out now. <laughs> um, so he doesn't and he doesn't get non-binary at all. Like it's just not a thing that he's. Like, hello. Um, but yeah, so he throws me out and he's like, yeah, and wants to talk about women together, and I just can't, 
you know, like, I just, that's just not who I am. Um, and then my mom is like still struggling with it, but it's starting to come around with my name. And um, I think that another thing that I, I learned is that um, at some point, I had to learn that my, my parents are also humans, right? Like, when we're younger, we just don't see our parents that way, right? Um, and so, like, I had to also learn that in their grieving process, there was also um, their coping mechanism comes out, right? And our coping mechanisms are not always the healthiest and also are not as going to be directed at us, right? So, um, I think that it's this exchange of, you know, trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. But what do you think has helped your parents um, get to know who you are now and be more comfortable with who you are, whether they like it or not? Honestly, forcing it on them <laughs> um, and not and not accepting and having uh, a sort of level of like, uh, how do I say this? Having my boundaries. It's like, I will not accept that you will not use my pronouns. I will not accept that you won't use my name. And I will say it every single time. Or, and then make an agreement. Um, one of the things I did with my mom was like making an agreement. I was like, I've heard you say my dead name about this many times, and I'm not going to tolerate that. Will you say what a dead name is for those who don't know? Um, a dead name is the name that you were given, um, assigned at birth or by your parents. Um, and so I refuse to allow my mother to continue after a certain amount of time i refuse to let my mother call me by that name after i've already told her my my chosen name cool yeah. cool, cool. A little, another little fun fact about you is you were in the navy i was oh my what was what, what was that like um, it was awful. What age, um, what age were you? For <laughs> contextualize it, how old were you? Where were you? Yeah, um, I went in when I was about 22 or 23. Um, I was stationed on an aircraft carrier, uh, which is how I ended up in Seattle. We were ported in Everett, Washington. Um, and uh, so the military is so interesting because not only was it during the time of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a law um, in which gay folks, um, I, don't, I don't even know that trans folks were even like part of this at all at that time. But um, you basically could not, if you did not say you were gay, no one had to know and you could stay. But if you did say, you were out, right? And so, and but the law, the law goes deeper than that in which even, like from my understanding, even straight folks that were having what was considered gay sex were also under that law. So like if you got caught doing gay sex and you were still straight, like you could get kicked out for that. Isn't that the stupidest thing you ever heard? Okay, anyway, so, um, so yeah, so it was during that time and also the military because of the way we had to, they, the housing and all the things um, was super gendered. Right, and so like there was a female birthing and there was a male birthing, and that's like where our living spaces were. And so I was often with like 96 other women in this, you know, very large aircraft carrier thing and having to live together. And sort of, and like in boot camp, I was referred to as female, not as my name, but like as female. So it was just a very hard time to and. It was definitely not a time that I was exploring gender in any sort of way. Um, it was just sort of what I accepted. Um, and women, much like the rest of the world, were also like s treated as second-class human beings in that institution as well. So, mm. yeah. Do you have any? Sen were there any trans people that you knew in the um, military at all? I don't. I don't know that there was ever a moment that we like. If there were, that there was a moment that was safe enough mm. to be able to say so. Totally. Totally. Tell us about your um, experience. So, did, did you coming out? I'm sure there are many coming out experiences. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. But yeah. what are some of the highlights? Highlights. Um, I came out as a as a, a super gay uh, in high school, um, but that was because my mom walked in on me having sex with my ex girlfriend. Um, Ooh, that'll do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just couldn't get any better than that. Um, but that was a thing um, that happened and then I had a second coming out so I was about I think I was 16 at the time I want to say I was 16 um, and then uh, I came out again as a non-binary non-binary trans person at 31 um, so like I had a long range of time to do to discover myself and finally admit some things and um, so yeah like uh, I had two different coming outs uh, and then sexuality has become this weird, fluid thing ever since then, and I don't feel like the need to come out about it. I just, it's just an interesting thing. Yeah, I think what people don't understand, especially maybe the, like the gay or lesbian community, is that there are many coming outs. Yes. Well, anyone can come out many times about 
liking macaroni and cheese and liking right. all these different things. We're constantly evolving, right, right. but especially uh, folks in their gender because it is an ever changing, ever evolving thing for yeah. all of us. Totally. For all of us. So um, I think it's time that we start embracing evolving genders and not have them be so stagnant. I know, it's boring. Am I right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Where can we find you here in Seattle? Um, you can find me a lot of different places. So on the first, third, and sometimes fifth Tuesdays, I'm at Alchemy Poetry, which is an all, all ages uh, poetry series uh, at Love City Love, which is in Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and then I manage uh, You Speak Seattle, any You Speaks folks in the house? Hey, okay. So you speak Seattle, and our next uh, wild card slam is on March 29th at Centilia uh, Cultural Center, which is at uh, uh, El Centro de la Raza on Beacon Hill. Um, so, and that is sign up uh, doors at six, sign ups at 6:30, and then our grand slam, which is the most exciting time of year, is April 19th at Kings Hall in uh, Rainier Valley. If you want more information, please find me. I'm at Ebo Barton on across all channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I don't talk shit, so I'm not on Twitter. Um, <laughs> but um, you can also go to my website, ebobarton.com. Awesome. Everyone, thank you, Ebo, so much. Thank you. Yeah.